Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, so thank you very much for that kind of introduction, Ian. And uh, so today we're going to be looking at uh, this idea of model unity, which is something slightly different to what we've heard from some of the other talks. Um, so um, what, do, what do we mean by the unity of consciousness? Well, there's various, various different um, uh, ways of looking at it, but we usually what we mean is a uh, phenomenal unity. So when we look at this uh, coffee shop, you can imagine being there and really seeing the, the, the space around you, you're smelling the coffee, you're hearing the, hearing the music in the background. But actually there are some subtleties about this because, um, so you think about the unity of just the visual field, it's kind of very continuous, whereas when you have these other aspects, the, 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 the sound and the, uh, and, and the, the smell of the coffee, you know, there's lots of sort of continuum between visual things and these other things, and yet they're still there as part of your conscious experience. So there's some subtleties here, and perhaps moral unity can uh, kind of help us uh, with some of these, uh, these differences or subtleties. Okay, so we can talk about the unity of consciousness, and it's, I always think it's kind of weird that nobody ever seems to talk about their disunity of consciousness. Now, what, what do I mean by that? So here we have two friends, a lady called Alice and a guy called Bob. They're sitting there uh, by the river in Oxford and they clearly know each other really well. So we can talk about the Alice and Bob system. And clearly the Alice and Bob system does not have moral unity. Uh, Alice doesn't experience Bob's visual field, that kind of thing. Um, and yet, so uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, we see this uh, young lady, uh, Christina uh, Santos who had a hemispherectomy, so she had a whole half of her brain removed. And yet, you know, she went on to get a degree, a master's degree, and she has a family, and she's doing pretty well in life. And uh, so actually, the human brain is actually made up of two brains uh, interconnected. And so the issue then is, um, you know, you can have certain connections, and you might just make a few connections, you're not gonna get more unity, so you're not gonna get unity, but, um, you know, uh, what do you actually need then to have uh, a unity of perception between uh, brains or between brain regions and so forth? And uh, so I uh, sort of argue that this idea of modern unity might be able to help in this area as well. Okay, so um, this whole idea of modern unity is an extension of a theory that's been around for 10 years now, so it's kind of having its birthday. First paper on expected flow tension minimization came out in uh, 2012. And uh, so, what, what on earth is what do on earth is this about? So, I'm going to basically introduce this a little bit first, and then we'll go back to modern unity once we understand what the theory is that we're extending. So, um, I have here in this blue box something I call a fundamental postulate of EFB minimization. When inside, in the context of the theory, it's kind of like a postulate, but really it's almost like a hypothesis that ultimately the mathematization is, is uh, hopefully going to you know, be able to test, if you like. Um, so I'll just read this out, and, um, and then I'll present another slide which will hopefully make it a little bit more understandable what this thing actually is trying to express and explain. So, um, uh, if we suppose that consciousness is given by an interpretation of system states, then amongst the infinitely many possible interpretations, consciousness is given by some form of minimal expected entropy interpretation of the system states that yields experience free of unnecessary discontinuities whilst exhibiting the intrinsic structural regularities of probable system states. Okay quite a lot to kind of handle there. I, I would say, uh, at the end of the talk, I'll give the paper that this is in, mm -hmm. and I kind of, if you're interested, I invite you to come back to the posture and look at it again on another occasion and try to think about it a bit more. And, you know, so for example, maybe it's, uh, if it's sort of self-evident enough, you might even say, well, perhaps it's then a missing axiom from IIT or something. So I asked, uh, to know yesterday whether you might consider that there might be still room for more accidents. So I'm going to explain what that long statement actually means, that kind of hypothesis. So here we are at the top, if you look at the image at the top of the slide, suppose that's the image that's falling on the retina. Um, so that's uh, 
kind of the, 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 the boundary of the system or the outside world, if you like. But then that affects what's going on in the brain, and then we can talk about what the interpretation is um, of the state of the brain under that stimula stimulation. And we see on the right-hand side, um, you get the, you know, there's an image there, there's this one possible interpretation. You know, I said there's infinitely many possible ways to interpret the system states. This one, you've got these very abrupt uh, color transitions. Um, and then when we look at the middle, middle one, uh, you've got this sort of vertical and horizontal uh, abrupt transition in the image. But then we, when we look at the right-hand side, you have something which kind of look, looks right. You know, it still has some transitions in there. If you look at the sort of roof of the house, there's an abrupt transition there with the blue of the sky. But that's, that's the right one. And, um, uh, and you might say, well, hang on a moment, isn't, it, isn't our conscious experience like that, simply because that's what's falling on the retina? You know, what, what, what's there to explain here? What, what's this thing about? Um, but of course, we also dream, so you can imagine you're, you're dreaming and you're in a dark room with your eyes closed, and yet you could be dreaming right, in a very sort of uh, um, clear way, lucid way, of a room or a scene which looks just like that. And you don't experience, uh, you know, your, your experience is not some higgledy piggledy jigsaw or strange mosaic or something like that. So it has this uh, regularity uh, in the image. So this is what it kind of means. You know, I go back to the postulate that uh, consciousness is some form of minimal expected entropy interpretation of the system states that is kind of uh, um, preserving the kind of regularities. And um, it's an expected quantity. So I'm not going to just introduce some mathematics because uh, this is not hard. I'll explain it very clearly, hopefully. And um, so. Um, we have a, a system of nodes. The nodes need, need not be neurons. They could be larger structures. And we have uh, system states. So the F, the F here is a system state. And we have some kind of relational model. So in this case, we have two relationship matrices, R and U. One is on the nodes of the system. One is on the states that the nodes can be in. And uh, so if we look at this, uh, expression on the left-hand side, um, you can see that it's a function of the model, so you've got R and U in there, and it's also a function of the system state, F. But what actually is this? What is this, this number that's coming out? Well, it's, it looks like a, a, an entropy. It's got a log in there, and um, um, it's uh, basically what you have here is um, it, it's the log of the number of system states for which um, how well the model um, suits that system state is, a, is at least as good as how well the model fits the system state of interest, which is F. So um, if, you're, if your system state is really, really close to the model, it kind of really kind of respects the structural um, aspects of the model, then you're going to have a, a low value here. Uh, because there's not going to be very many other states that kind of beat it or are the same. Most of them are going to be more complicated, you might have more transitions and so on. So this just gives you the what we call the flow tension here of just a single system state. Okay, but um, the brain, for example, is very biased toward being in certain states over other states, and we can represent that bias with a probability distribution. So the probability distribution is just giving weights to the states depending on um, how strong a bias the system has to be in certain states. Of course, once you've got a probability distribution, you can then take expected quantities. So now we're summing over all of the system states um, and we're coming up with an expected flow entropy value, which is this uh, top expression that uh, many can see because there you can. So it says this top expression here. Um, and the middle one here, you don't need to really worry about that. That's just a, an approximation when you're using data. So you don't need to really worry about that. But the thing at the bottom is um, basically we then do a minimization. So this curly, curly R and curly U um, is the kind of optimal model. It's the R minimum of the expected flow entropy. So you're 
and finding the best possible model that could minimize the expected float entropy of the system. Um, and just to kind of make, understand this a little bit better, I'm going to just give you a really simple example. In lieu of actual system states, we use photographs or digital photographs. So you can imagine each digital photograph in the stack is like a different state of the system. And uh, in lieu of nodes, we uh, just have the sampling locations. So you can just sort of see here a little grid of sampling locations. And we use that same grid on each, each image in the stack to create uh, a set of data. And then we um, do expected float entropy minimization, and we get our relational model out, which is this thing here, and it's really hard to understand. So I've then also put it as a, a, a graph to make it easier to see. So basically, you can see here, we've recovered the uh, relationships between the uh, sampling locations. So this here gives you the geometry of the field of view. Um, and then we also have the relationships between the grayscale that's used. So it also work, sorry, it also does work for color. So we've done in color as well, um, but in this case it's for the grayscale. So black is very strongly related to dark gray, which is kind of reasonably related to light gray, and that's related to white. But white is related to black, for example. And th th this thing here is just showing that. Um, so this is this is. Um, EFE on the x-axis, and if you just choose models at random, then you end up at this end of the axis. And you can just this is just to show that actually for the minimal uh, model, um, it's well separated from other potential models. So basically, the correct model is being strongly determined through this minimization. Okay. Okay, so we've now got the foundations to actually now start to talk about model unity and what, what this thing's about. Okay, so again, we have our system S of nodes, and we now introduce partitions. So we have S hat being the set of all possible partitions. However, we don't mean partitions in the sense of IIT. Nobody's chopping up the system. We're just literally saying, um, I have a system of nodes, and I can view that system of nodes as a collection of subsystems. So a particular partition is just one way of viewing that system as a system of subsystems. And uh, so for one such way of, of doing that, you know, we, we can use this character curly X um, as one, one uh, partition. Okay, again, we have this probability distribution on the system, which captures the bias of the system toward being in certain system states over others. And now we can define this quantity mu. It's very simple. Basically, we're summing the expected float entropies over the partition. Um, and we're using for each of the uh, um, subsystems the optimal model optimized for that particular subsystem. And then we're subtracting from this um, the situation where you actually keep the system all as one and you don't chop it up at all. You just take it as, as a whole and you have a single optimal model. So we subtract that term. And uh, this bit of text here, well, I pretty much said all of that. P of X is just the marginal probability distribution that we're using in these, uh, in these terms here. And now we can define model unity. So uh, we have this uh, uh, <coughs> N only depends now on P. And uh, basically, um, it's the minimum mu over all possible partitions of your system. And if N is more than or more than or equal to zero, then we say the system has got body unity. And that kind of makes sense, because if we go back to mu, if this is more than or equal to zero, then basically the uh, you can't do better than having a single model. So these, this last term here is um, at most as large as this. And uh, um, if that's a strict inequality, then it will be less. And small, the smaller the expected flow entropy, the better. So that's why uh, this uh, kind of definition makes sense. OK, so, okay, so there's a kind of uh, tension here. So when we're doing all of this. So sometimes when you use uh, a, a one model, so just one single model, which is stretched across the entire system, 
Well, you get lucky, and it actually is a good model for the individual subsystems as well. And then you get an advantage, because then your model doesn't just use the parameters within the subsystems, it also has parameters between the subsystems as well. So there's advantages to using a single model. There's a kind of direction there. But then, if I go to the other side here, in the other direction, sometimes you're having just one model does not fit all of the subsystems well. And uh, in this case, having the relationships between the subsystems can actually damage your model. Um, so in this case, it's actually better to have individualized bespoke models for each of the subsystems rather than trying to get a single model to fit the entire system. Okay, so, okay, so uh, we talked about Alice and Bob um, at the beginning. So there they were sitting next to the river in Oxford. And uh, so we're going to go back to Alice and Bob again now. Um, and uh, first of all, let's just think about Bob on his own. So Bob is there sitting by the river in Oxford still. And um, so what, what do we actually have here? Well, we have a, again, we have a stack of photographs. We're just using photographs um, as a sort of uh, um, synthetic version for system states, if you like. So we have a big stack of photographs here. And uh, we have these sampling locations, which are our nodes. And we have six of those. And then um, on this plot, basically along the x-axis, each point on the x-axis represents a different way of partitioning Bob's system. Um, and then for each of those, we then calculate this mu. So we have mu along the y-axis. We get all of these points. And then from the definition of uh, model unity, uh, we said that if m is more than or equal to zero, then we have modern unity. And indeed, when we look at this, we find that m does indeed have um, a positive value. So in this case, you cannot do better than using a single model stretched across the whole system, single relational model. Um, and uh, so Bob has modern unity. So if that was his visual cortex, you might say yes. It's, it's unified. And of course, we're only using six points here, but you can imagine, computationally, very difficult to do. You can imagine having you know, millions of points and uh, finding that it had unity. Uh, hasn't been done, of course. <laughs> OK. But now let's go to the Alice and Bob system. So what we have here is two stacks of images, and we've paired them up. So Alice is now by the river, and Bob has gone downtown Oxford. So I'm mixing up American and English here. So he's downtown Oxford. <laughs> and, uh, and so we've got three nodes from Alice, and we've got three nodes from Bob, and we call that the Alice and Bob system. And we do exactly the same as what we did in the last uh, example. So we look at all of the different partitions, and we work out what the new value is going to be. And then we plot them on this xy graph. Um, and then we look at the, the minimum. And in this case, m has got a negative value. It's well below the, uh, the, the x-axis. And of course, so going back to our definition of model unity, this system does not have model unity. Um, and it's also a blue point. It's colored, colored blue. And when we look at this key at the top, well, blue uh, relate and corresponds to when you have this, the system partitioned into two subsystems. And of course, the two subsystems that this relates to are the Alice system on its own and the Bob system on its own. So that in this case, we don't have model unity and um, Alice and Bob, well, you know, uh, this is sort of suggestive that they do not have shared vision experience. It is okay. So I'm racing ahead a bit, but I'm going to get some interpretation and conclusion from this. So, what, what's written on this slide um, relates to further experiments which were actually done in the in the paper. So um, now I've kind of shown you one of the experiments that were done, but uh, there's there's more in the paper that also helps to provide some evidence these statements here. So um, first of all, um, 
relational models give interpretations of system states, and that comes from the theory itself, the underlying theory, and uh, I'll show you the references in a moment, which you can look at if you're interested to look at that. Um, if consciousness is an interpretation of system states, then arguably it is given by a minimum expected entropy interpretation. So this goes back to the postulate again, because we see a kind of regular world, we don't see a world which is like a strange collage of, you know, all mixed up, it's all nice and ready. Um, from the experiment we've seen here, we have some evidence that the Alice and Bob system would not have model unity. It hasn't, and then the next one, it hasn't actually been done, but um, uh, it, it's likely that uh, layers within Bob's visual cortex would have model unity. There's some complicated it's really hard to actually do that because, as I say, we don't assume that the nodes have to be individual neurons. There could be cortical columns or some other structures. But uh, there we are. So there's, yeah, okay. Um, and then a system involving both Bob's visual cortex and his auditory cortex would not have model unity. And, um, uh, well, which is correct since visual things and auditory things um, are not the same. Um, so, sorry, so because visual things are not auditory things, and we should therefore expect them to have uh, separate models. So basically, you know, you can have a model for the visual cortex, and you can have a model, you know, the system is defined determining a separate model for the auditory cortex. Um, however, and, and this bit I haven't really explained really, so if we go back to um, expected flow entropy, uh, the, the underlying theory, it actually says that there's a hierarchy of these relational models. So you start off at the bottom with the primary relational model, which gives you simply just things like the geometry of the field of view, the relationships between colours. Once you have that, then you can then go to objects within their, that geometry and then have relationships between those objects and so forth. So you have this hierarchy of models. And um, so, so in this case, Bob's visual cortex and his auditory cortex won't have model unity. However, um, this is at the level of primary, primary models. And presumably, there is model unity at a higher brain level spanning both visual objects and auditory sounds. That, that work hasn't been done, but there we go. Um, so here's the, the papers. Um, the, the top one there in bold is the one which directly relates to this talk. Um, and then the one below it, paper number two, that one is about the underlying theory and it gives lots and lots of examples in there. So all of, the, all of this work is kind of like a, a good example, perhaps, of, of the approach, the general approach in mathematical consciousness science where you have a hypothesis, you mathematize it, you then do experiments to see whether the results of those experiments have some correspondence to what we know about consciousness through introspection. So this is exactly what's been done in this research. It's been, it's a, it's a hypothesis, it's a hypothesis that's been mathematized and then actually experiments using computers are undertaken to calculate these quantities and see how the theory actually pans out. So um, I hope perhaps there's also evidence in support of NCS type risk type uh, approaches in general as well. Okay, so thank you so much for your time for listening.